Hello, welcome to Bible study. My name is Tim Perkins. Well, those of you in the Louisville Assembly probably have a clue as to what tonight's lesson is about from the title. And those who don't have a clue, well, you're going to find out real soon. So you can see our background picture is a person climbing up steps. Uh, but before we begin, let us go to prayer. We want to pray that I throw out some good seed to you and that it lands on some good soil and makes a positive difference. Also, I would request that you remember a couple of particular needs. One is Brother Bob and Sister Jeannie King, who recently lost their youngest son. And the other is Marky Farmer, who is the son of Steve and Becky Farmer in Nashville. He had a serious operation recently, and there may be more medical intervention necessary. So we want to remember them in our prayers. Let's go to prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Almighty God, we come to you with these petitions because we know you have the answer. Lord, help this class to be beneficial for anyone hearing it. And please especially remember the King family as they deal with this loss and the farmer family, Lord, intercede there. Lord, make the difference. Come in and help our brother Mark. We ask these things in your mighty, glorious name. Amen. Okay. Well, let's not stay in suspense anymore. Let's find out what these are the 10 easy steps to. There we go. The 10 easy steps to. Dun, dun, dun. Perfection. And like I said, I think most of the Louisville folks knew this is what's coming. But this was a phrase coined by Brother Clarence Rader over 20 years ago while we were at the Frankfurt Haldeman Church. And he based this statement on uh, these scriptures here, Second Peter, first chapter, verses five through eight. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these, th if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Brother Rader often used as an example at that church at Frankfurt Haldeman, there was a balcony in the back, which you could see from the front. And he'd always say, of course, it would be impossible for someone to just jump from the ground floor up into the balcony. But if you went back in the foyer where the steps were, you could get up into the balcony one small step at a time. And of course, he likened these steps here to working your way to that goal of charity and hence perfection. Now, I should go back up. You notice at, at verse eight, it says, for if these things be in you and abound, they shall make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, person might argue, it doesn't say you'll become perfect. It just says you'll be, uh, that if you have these, you will not be unfruitful. And I want to point out, Jesus likened the development of plants to personal Christian growth on many occasions. There's the parable of the sower and seed in Matthew 13, and the parable of the wheat and the tares also in Matthew 13. He spoke about being the true vine and us the branches in John 15. And he likened the fruit of a good tree versus the fruit of a bad tree in Luke 6. So uh, being fruitful is the goal we're trying to have. We're trying to develop the fruits of the spirit to be in our life. And of course, the person would say, well, th those previous, that previous scripture in first, second Peter doesn't say anything about prayer or fasting, alms and offerings, church attendance, testimonies. I mean, there's all kinds of things it doesn't include. 
Those things, that list there, are tools to help us advance along the 10 steps. I guarantee you to get anywhere with those 10 steps, prayer is definitely going to be a tool you use. And all the various other things, coming to church, hearing the preacher, the testimonies of the other saints will help us grow in developing those 10 different steps. So let's examine those steps and see what they tell us. See, if, make sure we understand what those 10 steps involve, what they're, what they're about. So the step, the first one was, he said, add to your faith and so forth. So faith is actually the first three steps. I know you're saying three. Well, once again, this comes from Peter when he was talking in Acts 2, there in verses 37, 38. Now, when they heard this, meaning his preaching up to that point, they were pricked in their hearts. They were convicted and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So there are our first three steps. Repent, be baptized, receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So in 1 Peter, when he says, add to your faith, he's talking about adding to your initial salvation. This is your beginning steps in coming to the Lord. And while those three steps all seem to kind of act as one thing so often in our churches, there are three distinct steps there. I mean, repenting alone is a big step. Preaching to someone under conviction to understand their life is not in sync with God, that they need to be sorry for their sins and accept Jesus as their Savior. So repenting is a big step. And it's hard to imagine after someone's felt the weight of sin lifted off them that they would not want to be baptized in water, but being baptized in water is another step because it is your public confession to everyone who's witnessing this, that you are taking the Lord as your Savior. And then, of course, you're receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. I, You know, it doesn't tell us in Acts 2 um, all the events that took place there. It does say that uh, 3,000 were saved that first day. And in my mind, if I play it out, I can see Peter preaching to them. And such conviction falls over so many there, that the next thing you know, the 120 are helping people pray through to be to receive salvation. And then I, I can just see the 12 apostles telling everybody, here, come follow us. And they go find one of the pools there in Jerusalem, uh, Pool of uh, Siloam, or maybe the Pool of Bethesda. And they're in that pool, and people are lining up to get baptized by the apostles right there in the pool. And as they come up, I'd be surprised. I, it wouldn't surprise me that every person came out of that water speaking in tongues. These were the apostles of Jesus Christ, saving these people, bringing them into the church. Uh, so I can see how that happened like that, even in today's, uh, back then at that time, when the 3,000 were being saved on the first day. Now, why did Peter compile this list of add to your faith, virtue, and virtue, knowledge, and so forth? Well, I think verses 1 and 9 kind of give us a clue. To me, it gives an impression that Peter is, in, is uh, giving this list mostly to new Christians so they understand what are the next steps after their initial salvation. Look at the first verse. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have attained like precious faith with us. Now that no, that doesn't mean they're not they're necessarily brand new converts, but it does imply these are probably people who haven't been in the church long at all. And then it goes, you know, then he goes through starting in verse five, goes through the list of what to add to your faith and that these things need to be in you. And in verse nine he says, But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. And no, that wouldn't necessarily mean a brand new convert either. But I just get the sense that based on these two verses, that Peter had in his mind that uh, 
there are Christians who, okay, they come into the church, they get the Holy Ghost. Now what? You don't stop there. That's the beginning of your journey with the Lord, not the end. So I think that's why he started saying, okay, now that you've been saved, filled with the Holy Ghost, now here's some things to start doing in your life. And I do believe there is an order to those things. It just wasn't random what came to his mind. He said, add to your faith virtue, and then to virtue knowledge, and so forth. So let's explore those. So step four is virtue. In Luke, we have this verse. Jesus said, somebody hath touched me, for I perceive that virtue has gone out of me. And the reason I put that verse there is the word, the English word virtue is translated from two different Greek words. One means power, as in the verse above there in Luke 8. But that's not what this means here in 2 Peter. The other English word virtue comes from a word that means moral cleanness. And in fact, it's used again in Philippians 4.8. So why is virtue the first step after faith? Well, like it says here, because when one is saved and they often bring a lot of bad baggage with them from the world, after you get a fish into a boat, that's when you begin to clean it. You know, you don't receive the Holy Ghost and boom, you're now perfect and ready to go. No, you, you can easily have brought old habits and bad things from your former life in. And we want to start scrubbing and getting that dirt out so that you start living like a Christian. Uh, forget the old ways and start bringing on new ways. Okay. Um, so some of the things you need to clean up, you know, you may have had, <laughs> you may have had a bad habit with some of the words you used in your old life. Get rid of that stuff. The places you go, uh, your <laughs> old friends are typically not there to support your new journey with the Lord. They won't understand why you did it. And they'll tell you, you must've been brainwashed and that you're going to miss the old ways. So, you may need to find yourself a new set of friends. They'll notice a difference. If you, if you become a Christian and you're trying to live a Christian lifestyle, your old friends are going to notice something's different about you. And the places they want to go with you won't always be a good place to go. If you used to frequent the bars and nightclubs, uh, you, need to, you need to cancel that stuff. out. Look, there's still a lot of pull in a new Christian towards old things. Not initially, but over time, you may start remembering places you went and things you did, or even the way you used to think. And all that needs to change. Uh, it all needs to be replaced with the better things that the Lord has to offer. And Paul struggled with this just as much in the churches he was visiting. That's why I put this passage here from Ephesians. This is the Apostle Paul writing to the saints at Ephesus. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them. Uh, Ephesus had a lot of Gentiles in it, and Gentiles were coming into the church, <clears throat> and Paul's letting them know that was an old life. You need to have a, a, a new life now. Verse 19, who, meaning the Gentiles are still unsaved, being past feeling, have given them so themselves over to lasciviousness, to work all cleanness with greediness. That doesn't exactly sound like virtue. But ye have not so learned Christ, if so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. You're learning something new about a new way of living, verse 22, that you put off concerning the former conversation or lifestyle, the old man your old nature, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you put on the new man, which is what you received there from the Lord. When you were born again through the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you become a new creature, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth as his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Yeah, some things will upset you, but don't let it drive. You know, your old way, you may have gotten angry and started fights. No, no, you may still get bothered by some things, but don't let it push you into sin. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Meaning, 
straighten things up that same day. If something's upsetting you, find a way to come to a resolution. Verse 27, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication. You know, the way we talk can just be a denigrating and run people down. Don't let that come out of your mouth. But that which is good to the use of edifying. In other words, as you talk to people, you want to build them up. You want to encourage them. You want to help them, not tear them down. That it may minister grace unto the hearer. Verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Meaning, don't let the way you act and talk uh, grieve the Spirit of God within you. In other words, your Holy Ghost, when he hears and sees these things, he's going to be hurt. You're not following Christ. You're letting that old man win. Put down that old man, put up the new man. Verse 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Now, verse 32 can be difficult for a lot of new Christians because of how strong their old ways can have on them. But this is the goal you're shooting for. And the reason I put this scripture from 1 Peter down here is talking about your old friends. When you give your life to Christ and your old friends see it, uh, they're not going to understand. Uh, don't think you're going to run right out and save them and pull them in. Uh, unless Christ is dealing with them, they'll just think, poor Joe has gone off the deep end. This was Peter saying, for the time past of our, of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the gent." What he's saying is, look, in the past, it may have been fine in our life that we did what everybody else did. When we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excessive wine, revelings and banqueting and abominable idolatries, wherein they think, it's strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot speaking evil of you, meaning your friends aren't going to understand why you're not out uh, with your lust and excessive wine and revelings and banquetings and idolatries and all that. They aren't going to understand why you've gotten rid of that uh, way of life, and they'll speak evil of you. So that is a, that is. Okay, we're not. So that is the virtue, what we're talking about, about cleaning up our lives, uh, looking like a Christian, sounding like a Christian, acting like a Christian, that God can be well pleased in how we think and behave. Now, that's the first thing when a person, granted, some, like myself, I was raised in the church all my life. I didn't have the stain of, I did not have as big a stain of the world on me when I came to Christ. It wasn't as hard, but there are people that come in out of the world and they've tasted of everything in the world and, and hopefully they've gotten sick of it. You know, a lot of these things are easier. A lot of these changes are easier to take place when you've gotten sick of the world, when you come to Christ. But if you're not sick of the world, some of those things uh, can can have a pull on still got their you know their claws in you i've heard of i've heard testimonies where people said they got the holy ghost and they lost all their desire to smoke because smoking i, I know something about the uh, habit of smoking and the addiction of it not that i did it i worked for a tobacco company and i was privy to certain things and yes they want you addicted to their cigarettes because they're trying to sell more of them and it can be a hard habit to break and I've heard testimonies where people lost their desire for cigarettes right then when they got the Holy Ghost. And I think God was doing them a favor, you know, trying to have one less struggle coming to them. But what if he doesn't, you know, uh, this will be something you have to battle with. And the church understands that. So if you're having, if you come to the Lord brand new or even now, and you're struggling with things, talk with your pastor. Let him pray for you because uh, we want to help everybody live the kind of clean life they would want to live for the Lord. Okay.
Moving on. Now, after virtue, knowledge. Learn the word of God. When a person first gets saved, they not, may not know the first thing about the Bible. I remember Brother James Souders used to say often that when he first was saved, he didn't know if the book of Luke was in the Old Testament or the New Testament. I mean, yes, the Bible for a lot of people is just, you know, completely foreign. But once you've been saved, once you have received the Holy Ghost and God and the Lord are so real in your life, you start to see the Bible in a whole new way, and now you want to learn about it. And as Peter said, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. It's important to get started and let your pastor guide you into how to get started. You know, there, there's certain passages in the Bible. You don't just start right off as a new Christian because it'd be very difficult and confusing. Uh, I would recommend to anybody is, that came to the Lord and they don't know the first thing about the Bible, start with the gospels the story of Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And as that starts to get a hold on, they'll want to read other passages. And, and so the, your pastor can help guide you into the areas of the Bible that would help you grow as a newborn babe. He can show you where the milk is. And Paul had to deal with the same problem in, uh, in his churches, that there in Corinthians. And I, brother, could not speak unto you as to spiritual, but as unto carnal even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able, for ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envy and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? What he's saying to, to these particular brethren, he's talking about how they were still very carnally minded, therefore uh, trying to... Uh, deal with meteor things in the Bible they weren't ready for. They, they were still babes and needed to uh, drink milk. Excuse me one second while I deal with this. Sorry about that. Phone's always ringing around here. Um, you, uh, a baby cannot start with meat. A baby starts with milk, his mother's milk. It's got all the nutrients that that baby needs. Now, eventually, that baby's going to move into solid food. But you know what a baby needs before it can start working on solid food, like meat? It needs teeth. So there's got to be a growing and development process so that the teeth can come out, and then they can start working on a little bit of meat. But uh, for a spiritual babe, those teeth aren't going to start showing up till you start becoming more spiritually minded instead of carnally minded. And the Lord even tried to tell Israel the same thing in Isaiah. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. They are now ready for heavier matters. Uh, Paul wrote about this in the book of Hebrews. He was chastising them because they seemed not to understand uh, that uh, they did not seem to understand the principles of God. Uh, they were still bound up in the law, and therefore they weren't even ready for the meteor matters of uh, grace. Uh, Hebrews 5, for when, for when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. And, are, and you've become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Those senses, spiritual senses, you have to start becoming spiritually minded so that you can see the difference between good and evil in the word of God and uh, therefore can start taking on the stronger meat uh, subject matter. Now, why the importance of learning the word of God? Well, as we know, Solomon, uh, when the Lord asked Solomon what he wanted, he asked for wisdom to rule Israel. And, of course, God granted him that kind of wisdom. So when Solomon was writing the book of Proverbs, he was trying to pass along advice uh, to his children to come. And there in Proverbs 2, where he writes, My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, and those are the words and commandments he had learned from the Lord, so that thou 
incline thine ear unto wisdom, and apply thy heart to understanding. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge, and lift up thy voice for understanding, if thou seek her as silver, and searcheth for her as hidden treasure, meaning, if you'll make a diligent, deliberate desire to gain understanding and wisdom, verse 5, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Uh, the scripture says he'll fill the hungry full of good things. And there was that uh, beatitude, Jesus said, uh, blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. You've got to hunger and thirst for these kinds of things. If you don't have a desire for the word of God, um, it may have a hard time lodging in you, and uh, you're going to wind up staying on milk, and that's not good. Well, there are scriptures on that point here in James. Uh, if any man lacks wisdom, which is understanding, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Uh, yes, reading the Bible is one thing, but if you don't feel you're fully absor absorbing it, Pray that God helps open your mind to really getting the uh, full impact of the scriptures you're reading. And once again, talk with your pastor. Let him break it down even further. And I, I put this in here from Colossians. I want to make a point with it. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing, admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Many people in the body of Christ get songs from the Lord. And as they do, those songs often contain uh, bits of the doctrine of the body of Christ. So even the songs you sing can help encourage your mind and uh, renew your mind with uh, understanding and knowledge from the Lord because they have, they have, you know, little uh, pearls and diamond nuggets uh, of, the, of the teaching, which help reinforce it in our mind. The next step after knowledge is temperance, or quite simply, self-control. A Christian must develop discipline in their life. And discipline is pretty much you take responsibility for your actions. You do the right thing and you shun the wrong thing. Uh, it isn't that uh, you receive the Holy Ghost. And, you know, I know it says the Holy Ghost will lead you and guide you into all things. But uh, if, if you were faced with a, uh, a situation of whether to steal something or not, uh, the Holy Ghost is not going to slap your hand. And prevent you from stealing. You can go right ahead and steal those things, okay? But you should have the discipline in your life, which often is developed through the knowledge, okay? Uh, David said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or the seed begging for bread. Uh, if you're in a situation, you say, I need to steal bread to stay alive, then God knows you need bread to stay alive, and he can supply it. You need to have the discipline in your life saying, I'm not going to do the wrong thing regardless. The three Hebrew children did not bow down to that image. They had discipline in their life to know it was the wrong thing to do. Now, granted, the next bullet point I put there, there are times when we have temptations uh, or, or things that can bring about a bad thought or action, a trigger, you know, as it says here. We all have certain things that get under our skin. Uh, I need, uh, myself personally, I had to be careful to maintain my patience when stuck in traffic because, of course, I'll see other drivers not doing what I would do. That is causing the traffic to move slowly. And, and the first thought would be to want to say, what's wrong with you? <laughs> But I shouldn't be that way. Uh, I, you know, people are people. And so instead of letting that get under my skin, bring it out a bad spirit, it would be better to have what I say antidotes. For one, any 
thing that could lead to you wanting to lose your self-control, uh, prayer could help with that. But, but, you know, if it's not prayer, you could have a song that you turn to. I, I recommend a godly song that uh, helps take your mind off the trigger or temptation and helps you focus more on Christ. Or maybe there's a verse, you know, the 23rd Psalm. That would be a good psalm to memorize. And as something is uh, eating at you to where your self-control may not be quite there, just recite the 23rd Psalm in your mind. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want, and so forth. Uh, so the self-control is partly a natural thing. In other words, you have to take control, you have to take some responsibility to uh, live a proper life and be prepared uh, for when things come along. Don't react immediately. Be able to uh, keep yourself in check. And like I said, having something that you turn to, whether it be a prayer, a song, a verse, calling a friend, whatever, can help you keep your self-control instead of flying off at the handle. And that's why I put Philippians down there. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. And Christ can provide an antidote to help you maintain your self-control. Um, because there will be things that irritate you. But that's temperance. Now, I know I'm not spending a great deal of time on every one of these steps, but uh, I'm not trying to make this an endless class. And uh, I don't want to try and cover everything that, I, I don't want to try and cover every conceivable angle because it would be good for you to reflect on these things. When we're talking about self-control, how does that apply to my life? And you start, uh, examine it for yourself. Okay, moving on. Now, after temperance, self-control comes patience. And of course, the person would ask, well, how is this different from self-control? Well, this deals, this patience is our patience when it comes to other people or with God. Now, here are some familiar scriptures already that talk about patience with God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulation also, knowing that tribulation works patience. And what Paul is saying there is tribulation, meaning adverse conditions, problems in our life, as, as we learn to wait on God to solve those problems, we will, and of course, the, the next verse in Romans there is, uh, and patience worketh experience. That word experience is translated in 1 Timothy as proof meaning that experience we have learned, excuse me a second, there we go. As God comes to our, as God deals with our life in our various situations, we learn to have more and more trust in him. That's that patience in God, knowing that God is going to work out all things for our good. Like, and Isaiah said the same sort of thing. They that wait, upon the Lord, shall renew their strength. Your strength is renewed as you see God work out your situation. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint as God proves himself real in your life more and more. Then your inner man is renewed. You don't have that weariness. You can go on in the Lord more and more you begin to faint not because God has proven himself time and time again. But we have to have patience with other people. Romans 15, 1, we then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. And then in Galatians, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, Ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. And my point here is whether we're bearing the infirmities of the weak or our brothers overtaken in a fall. Those can be various kinds of things. You know, a lot of times, uh, you know, if you look at that scripture only from one angle, overtaken a fault, he must be trapped in sin or something. Well, maybe not. He's got something there's some kind of fault in his life. 
could be a bodily thing, disease or disability. That might be more of an infirmity. He could have emotional situations. You know, he might be suffering depression, anger management issues. Maybe he has a mental disorder or his character. He, ju he just doesn't know to do better than he is or he's trapped in sin. There can be all kinds of things that are a fault or an infirmity. And we want to help people. But in order to help people with those things, we first have to have a repentant spirit of our own because helping them, they may have, uh, you know, that overtaken a fault, that fault may have directly affected you. Now, how are you going to, you know, if, if some brother has offended you somehow, how can you be helpful to them if you're still holding a grudge for that? And these people's situations are such, we have to have a repentant spirit. So we can forgive them their shortcomings and be an aid to them. That's why Paul uses those words, spirit of meekness. Don't, um, in that instance in Galatians, of course, the spirit of meekness being, well, you'd never see that happen to me. Well, you don't know that it couldn't happen to you, whatever it be. If somebody had a, a gambling problem, well, you'd never see me go gambling. Well, you don't know what kind of situation you might find yourself in sometime. And now you're hooked on something that you need help getting away from. So that fault could be of many different things. And if we're going to be helpful, in other words, if we're going to be patient with others to help them, we're going to have to have a meek, repentant spirit so that we can be of assistance. Therefore, we need to put on that patience and, and to, you know, to temperance patience, learning to be gentle with other people, knowing that we all, as these, you know, we don't have eyes in the back of our head. Our hair could be a mess in the back and we wouldn't know it. We all need each other to help, uh, help each of us along the way as we journey in the Lord. That to me is what the patience is. After patience, you know, each of these things starts to add up. You've been saved in your faith. You're cleaning your life of getting bad habits and unchristian things out of your life with the virtue. You're reading your Bible. You're listening to your pastor. You're taking notes. You're trying to not only learn the word of God, but then apply it to your life. So because uh, if you, you couldn't just start with a brand new Christian and teach them the doctrine of perfection. Uh, it, it would seem impossible to a new Christian. There's no way I can get to be like Jesus. Well, but as they grow in the Lord and learn from the word, they'll see, yes, you can, because God has made a way for us to become like his son if we we'll use it. And then we learn to uh, control our lives, uh, the things that we can control, the, the uh, so that we're not an outburst. We're not uh, p other people don't mind being around us because they don't have to worry about us being rash. And we're learning to be patient with both God and other people so we can be helpful to them. Uh, these are all steps we're growing in. And now we want to start adding godliness into the equation. And I like to say the easiest definition of godliness is, is the opposite of worldliness. A carnal person wants the things of this world. A spiritual person wants the things of God. That's so why John and the first John wrote, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And I think the key thing here is that love not the world. You know, um, I like having a car as much as the next person because it helps me get to where I need to go. I can drive to church, you know, or drive to the store. But I don't want my, I don't want that car to become an idol in my life. I don't want to become overly um, taken in by it or whatever it would be. In other words, the things of this world, their brother Raider like to used to say, hold those things lightly. Uh, can you give them up? That, that's how you know, I guess, if you love something bad enough, can you give it up? What if you're, you lose the job you have and you're working at McDonald's and your car breaks down and 
can't work and you don't have the money to pay for it, you know, are you going to be upset that you now don't have a car and you've got to walk down to McDonald's for your job? Can you let go of the things of the world? Now, hey, I'm not saying I'm at that point necessarily either. That's a tough one to consider. How much of this world do I feel I need? In other words, you're saying I need the things of the world because God can supply all my needs, but we know he can. And I guess a little bit over and over time, we've got to learn to just let the things of this world, while we may have them, don't have a hard grasp on them. Uh, because the things of God need to be much more important to us. As it says in Titus, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men, meaning that's Jesus. That's the grace that brings salvation, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. That's how we're to live and not let the things of this world have a hold on us. You can measure your priorities by where you spend your time or time and money, if you want to say that. When you're not doing anything else and you're plopped on the couch watching TV or surfing the internet, watching sports, checking out Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, whatever. Maybe you really like food. You like to go dining out all the time. You're looking forward to your next restaurant adventure. You spend, I uh, now spending time with friends. I, I don't want to say don't spend time with your friends and, and the others in the church, uh, but everything you spend time on here is time you're not spending with the Lord. So you got to have, you have to have a balance. God deserves your time too. You can get caught up in work and acquiring wealth. You can get too caught up in your children and grandchildren. How often have you, uh, missed church to go to a birthday party of a grandchild. Now, I understand that the first birthday of your first child is super special. I get that. How, how could you ignore that or put that off? I don't even recall if we celebrate our child's first birthday on their birthday because hey, one-year-old, they wouldn't know whether it was their birthday or not anyway. But, you know, it's important to parents. I get that. So I'm not saying uh, everything about this is bad. It's all about having the right balance, okay? Um, and only you can assess that for yourself. I'm just saying where you spend your time. If your time is on this, it's not with God. Reading the Bible, going to church, uh, checking on others in the church. So. You'll have, you know, you're going to think about it and make a determination for yourself. But Jesus said, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And by saving his life, that means running your own life. You call in all the shots about your life. But whosoever will lose his life, give it to me, to Jesus, for my sake. The same shall save it. The bottom line? We must commit our entire life to Christ, 100%. Nothing less is acceptable. And that, that, you don't do that from the first day, maybe. But at, over time, as the things of God become to mean so much more important to you than things of this world, it'll just start to happen. And I said all this on God is because this is life and death. No man can serve two masters, the world or God. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And mammon means treasure. So what is your treasure? Where is your time? Where is your money spent? Where is your heart? Jesus said, where your heart is, there will your treasure be. It is, a, it is a balance. And the things of God, as the things of God grows in one's life, and the desires for this natural world fades, then one can say like Paul, godliness with contentment is great gain. Okay, we're adding to our life godliness. Things of this world mean a whole lot less. 
And he said, brotherly kindness. Now, brotherly kindness is love for the saints of God. Paul basically said that in Galatians, as we therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. You're going to have a hard time having love for everybody if you can't have love for the saints of God. And, and sure, it can be just as difficult sometimes to have that same feeling for the saints of God as you should, uh, because they can be difficult at times. Okay, I get that. But we're going to remember there are brothers and sisters. They have the same Holy Ghost as us. God saved them just like he saved me. And I should learn to have a love for them. Loving them is not necessarily that they're your best bud and you're around them all the time. Loving them is that you want to see things go well for them. You have nothing but the best uh, hope for them. You don't want to see anything bad happen to them. You may not share a lot of interests with them, you know, um, but I think the more you talk with them, get to know them, you will find things in common. And Paul was trying to get that point across to Timothy. Rebuke not an elder, an older man, but entreat him as a father and the younger men as brethren, the elder women as mothers and the younger as sisters with all purity. We need to see each other as our family. To entreat is to help, assist, comfort, strengthen. T tell me, think about your own family. Is there anything your mom and dad would need that you'd be unwilling to help them with? You know, if they needed a place to stay, would you not help them find a place to stay, whether it be in your house or some other place? No, we, we're to, we love our family. We need to treat each other, the saints of God, as our family, to be concerned about them. When they hurt, we hurt. When they're happy, we're happy. If they need our help and we can all do for them, we should try. Peter, in his first epistle, wrote, Seeing you have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, genuine love, see that you love one another with a pure heart, fervently. By fervently, of course, he means earnestly. Uh, no pretense. John 21, 15 to 17. I made note of that because that was that instance after the Lord had resurrected. And he was with Peter and he said to Peter, uh, do you love me? And Peter said, yes, I love you. And he says, feed my sheep. And then he asks the second time, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, I love you. And Peter says, feed my sheep. And he asks him a third time, do you love me? And Peter answers, Lord, you know I do. Now, if you've never heard a talk on those particular verses, the, the interesting thing is when he asks him if he loves him, the, the first two times, that word love there, uh, comes from the same root that uh, actually brotherly kindness comes from. Um, and it's more of a fondness, okay, that you would have for somebody. The third time uh, is the highest, the third time you ask him if he loves him is the highest form of love, um, agape love. And uh, it's, it's the most genuine love you would have for a person. And, and the point that comes from those verses is we can't just be fond of one another. We had to have a real love for one another that, uh, that drives how we treat each other, the people within the family of God. We have got to learn to have that kind of love for our brothers and sisters. But then there's another step. Charity. And charity is that highest form of love. And yes, you could, you could spend a whole class on the topic of charity. And, and I don't want to do that because it would be better that a whole separate class on charity and 1 Corinthians 13 was given. Because 
that's when we really have to examine our own hearts, put under the microscope in terms of how we deal with others, what stops us from having that kind of charity, that kind of feeling for all people. Um, let's see, where is that? Yeah, in, in Matthew, I think it's the seventh chapter. Um, seventh? Fifth, fifth chapter, I'm sorry. In Matthew 5, uh, verse 48 is the one that says, be ye perfect even as your heavenly father is perfect. But that was sort of like the summation of the verses that followed, where it talked about how the Lord makes the rain to fall on the just and unjust, and the sun to shine on the just and unjust, meaning God tries to be fair to all people. And that is the kind of uh, love, that, that's how we have to look at all people. It's, it's not easy, <laughs> I'm speaking of myself, it's not, the attitude I try to have, though I don't always succeed, with anybody actually is, if they do something that that hurts or, or, you know, I feel like they're deliberately attacking or, you know, just they're being against me. I try to have the attitude of, would I feel that, would they act that way if they were saved? If they knew the Lord, if they had God's love in their heart, their sins forgiven, they're on uh, the journey with the Lord, would that be how they would behave towards me? And and that helps me to, and I realize, of course, no, it's not. Excuse me. <coughs> no, uh, it's very unlikely that someone who had God's love in their heart would be would mistreat me. So therefore, I want to forgive them, knowing that they've not been given the advantage I have. And I'm not trying to say I'm perfect. I'm just trying to say God has helped me to understand what what He's done for me and how He. He forgave me my sins. He gave me a vision of the body of Christ. He helps me see what is awaiting those of us who put him first in our lives. There's such good things awaiting us. If, that's why a vision of the body of Christ is so important. There are such wonderful things ahead. And he's given me that opportunity. I should be so grateful that I reckon that when somebody does anything against me, I ought to be able to say, if they only knew what I knew, they wouldn't be that way. So forgive them and maybe find a way to help them. That's why I love this passage in Colossians. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God. Think of yourself as the elect of God. Think of that. The elect of God, the selected of God, the ones that God gave a vision of what his plan is about, who's put him in his church who wants to see you succeed. Therefore, when you're one of those people, you need to put on bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. I love that term, bowels of mercy. And the word bowels there is referring to your entire insides, not just your heart, not just a heart of mercy. You should be filled within your whole belly and chest of mercy forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against another, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Christ for, you know, I may not be the worst sinner that ever came to the Lord, but I had my, uh, I had a bag full of wrong things, and yet Christ was able to forgive it. Now, if he can do that, why can't I look past a little spat with a brother or sister? And then at 14, and above all these, even more important than all that, put on charity, God's type of love, which is the bond of perfectness. All these things are important to becoming a perfect Christian. And yes, you can be perfect. I should have put it in here and I didn't think to. My One of my favorite scriptures, Luke 6.40 the disciple is not above the master, but he that would be perfect shall be as the master. We are trying to become just like, our, that's why we're called disciples. We're trying to become just like our master, Jesus. And if we can have charity, that's the, 
That's the glue that's going to hold all these other things like mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving. All that can be held together by the bond that charity is. So as Paul told the Hebrews, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, that doesn't mean abandoning them. That means moving on beyond the principles. Let us go on unto perfection not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God and all the other things he mentions there. All those things are important, but we're going to move. We're going to take that as a foundation and we're going to build upon it and go on beyond those things unto perfection. Now, I want to come back to what verse eight says, because after all, this is the timely thing. If you add those 10 steps in your life, if you add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge and to knowledge temperance and to temperance patience and to patience godliness and to godliness brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness charity, if these things be in you and abound, meaning working full steam, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You get all 10 of those things working in harmony, just like a 10-cylinder engine, all engines firing like they should. Oh, you are way down the road. So that's why I added, let us use our time wisely. That's in the first chapter of 2 Peter. Look what he says at the end of this book. There's a reason he wants people to understand that. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also, and the works that are in therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation, that's lifestyle, and godliness, looking for and hasting, and by hasting, you could put the word anxious, looking for and anxious for the coming of the day of God. Not you're anxious for the judgment and destruction that's coming, but that the day of God has come. We're going to be caught up together and move into third heaven. And while that's happening, yeah, there's going to be trouble on earth. Heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. What a wonderful place to live uh, on a planet that's nothing full of righteousness. Now, I tell you, personally, I believe that these verses here are foretelling the judgment at the end time, not AD 70. Hmm. Uh, AD 70. What went on there? Yes, Jerusalem burned and a lot of things, but it's not like this depicts the great noise. I can, I've seen too many pictures of an atomic bomb to know that that is more applicable to this. And yes, God could put in Peter's mind to know something. There's going to come a judgment day that is more than you can imagine. And all Peter could say is, I saw everything burned up. Now, if you don't think atomic weapons will be used in the judgment of this world, well, you're just fooling yourself. I hate to tell you that. Guess I can stop sharing at this point. Anyway, uh, that's my lesson on the 10 steps to perfection, putting each one of those steps into your life. And it's not like you have to complete one to move on to the next one. You just keep working at them as you go. And just as this man is trying to get up steps, one step at a time, you too will get to your destination by applying these steps one step at a time. And we'll all be waiting for that glorious day of the Lord when he shall return. And those of us who are alive and remain shall be caught up together to forever be with the saints in the air. Well, I hope you've gotten something good out of this. And uh, we'll talk again next time. Bye-bye.